Historical Faith Society members, I'm very excited for today's uh, uh, video because we've got two special guests coming from other parts of the world. I have Dr. Peter Vanderveen coming from Germany and Maury Mikkel Baran coming from Israel. And I just want to thank you for, for being a part of this Historical Faith Society uh, video. And we're going to be talking about uh, the new movie coming out, Patterns of Evidence, Journey to Mount Sinai, of which you guys are involved with and in. And uh, I don't know who to start with. I'm going to go with Peter first because, Peter, I've known you for a number of years, and uh, you were working with the Berlin Pedestal, of which you saw the names of Israel in there. And so, are, was it Jerusalem? Which city was that? No, actually, this uh, pedestal relief has been in Germany since 1913, when um, the very famous Egyptologist Ludwig Borchardt, who became known because of the Nefertiti statue head, actually brought this pedestal relief to Germany, and it had been sitting in storage um, until something like the 1970s, and when then it was finally studied in 2001 by my late colleague, Professor so, um, Gurk, it only really became known. Uh, it had been in Germany since a long time and nobody paid attention. When um, Gurk saw that pedestal relief, he, he saw three name rings, one referring to a city in Canaan, re one referring to Canaan, and then he saw another name that was, um, it was only there for about two thirds of it, but he looked very carefully at this name ring and he suggested that it may well read the name Israel, which would then be the oldest reference to Israel in Canaan. Uh, and we've been working on this uh, ever since, and I still believe very much so that this is probably the most ancient reference to, uh, to Israel in Egyptian texts, yes. So Peter, you, you've been looking at these inscriptions for a long time, and then uh, Maury Mikkel, you have also been looking at the Hebrew text. Uh, you, obviously, Peter, you were looking at uh, Egyptian, but uh, uh, hieroglyphs. But uh, Maury, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, because you come from a, a special group within Judaism. I always look at uh, the, the the path that uh, I've been brought in in the last six years, and I. Uh, I, I facetiously uh, attribute it to uh, maybe uh, Hashem, that's what we call God, uh, you know, his sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> you know, you take a person, uh, you know, serving as a rabbi, you know, a, a, a rabbinical Torah scholar, and uh, who just, you know, happens to come from uh, also a, a secular background, uh, having a degree in um, evolutionary biology, that's, you know, written by my actual uh, in uh, to religion in my uh, very early 20s was actually from a place of academia. And then uh, I was, uh, you know, brought, you know, inside of the world of the, the yeshiva, uh, you know, traditional, uh, very serious and focused uh, Torah uh, study uh, in Israel uh, under um, yeah, great masters. And so I've always been a person who straddles uh, different worlds, and um, actually a student of mine, a Torah student of mine, a, um, a private one at that, uh, brought me into a relationship with um, David Roll, who of course is uh, uh, quite prominent in, in your films, and very deservedly so, and um, we just became the t tightest of friends. Um, he became a mentor to me. Uh, he looks at uh, to me uh, like a mentor to him. Uh, in the Hebrew, and we just had this great, great relationship. And he brought me into this field, actually, of uh, proto sinaitic Essentially, what makes my situation very unique is simply my um, fluency in all of what we call Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible in the Hebrew. And what really just shocked me, and um, as, you know, as well as him, and I would say more importantly, now my uh, uh, supervisor and professor, Dr. Peter Vanderveen, is how I'm able to uh, demonstrate my discovery that these very earliest inscriptions that uh, uh, David Roll first introduced me to, um, if you actually know biblical Hebrew very fluently, and for a, a Torah observant Jew, you know, this is our life. This is the air that we breathe. It's, it's our language. It's how we 
pray uh, daily in a year cycle just the torah portions uh, of the synagogue we go through um most of the bible and definitely you know the entire pentateuch every single year uh, several times these inscriptions lend themselves very well to be understood in a very plain and intuitive way uh, as uh, coming going back to biblical times and actually um, seeming to bring the story of the Exodus alive. And now I'm actually uh, working on uh, the end of this large project, which is from the uh, time that we believe that the biblical Joseph lived um, uh, around the time of uh, Pharaoh Amenemhat III. And this is just simply, um, you know, from a source that the academics never really considered consulting with. You know, um, you know, heaven forbid that they should actually consult with a um, a, 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 a rabbi, a, a master in Tanakh from that background. And, you know, essentially our Torah background, of, although it has evolved, it is an unbroken tradition going all the way back to those times. What you both have been working on is that there are inscriptions in the Sinai Peninsula. They're called Proto-Sinaitic inscriptions. And uh, as you were becoming aware of those inscriptions, uh, you were asked to actually read them or see if you could read them. And, and the thing that was unusual, I think, was that you could, you could recognize uh, the letters and you could recognize, um, I believe, was it words? Is that what you were starting to see when you looked at these inscriptions? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was most incredible because in this young relationship with David Roll, he simply sent me a string of letters and said, you know, do you understand, could you understand anything from an Exodus context? And what it is, is although, you know, there are no spaces between the, the, the words at this time, no breaks in the letters, it's just a string of letters. You are limited by what sense the word roots can give you. And if you just simply follow the rule of parsimony, that the simplest explanation is the most likely, um, I was blown away about how these letters just lend themselves to be divided up very intuitively into meaningful statements that really seem to um, be from the entourage of Moses. I'm speaking about uh, Sinai 357. He said, well, what do you think about you know this one? And he showed me Sinai 361. And I just couldn't believe that I was just able to read it. You know, it's not Holy Spirit. It's, in other words, it's, it, it is hard work. And um, there was a lot, there was consulting that went on. It is, uh, it's very, very uh, serious, critical work, never falling in love with your own theory. But it's, it, it is very real. And if you just have one or two inscriptions, you know, you might be able to say, well, you know, he has a bias. But when you have, you know, what is now, um, you know, six, seven of these inscriptions and you see that the same word roots are found throughout you see you know the same patterns throughout um they provide mutual support for one another and they seem to bring you know the historical moses perhaps um to, uh, to, to history so what happens here is that you ended up then connecting with peter and peter let's talk a little bit about what was going on because first of all you are two different, coming from two different faiths. Uh, you have uh, Judaism on one side, and Peter, you are a Christian, but both of you could see that there was a possibility here that there is something more that these inscriptions were telling us. So Peter, why did you become interested in what Maury McCall was doing? Well, first of all, um, I've been looking uh, since many years, originally also, also together with David Roll. Actually, we all uh, sort of worked uh, closer with him um, in the past. Um, I was looking at the time period when uh, most likely the Israelites would have been in Egypt. So once you agree on a certain time frame, you must uh, discover that we have from exactly the same period, you have the inscriptions uh, from Sinai. 
uh, they just simply fit into the picture perfectly based on the most recent um, uh, work on these inscriptions. They are dated uh, today to the Middle Kingdom and the Second Intermediate Period, but not later. In earlier days, they tended to date them later to the, to the New Kingdom period. But once you agree with that and you see that actually the evidence is really pointing to this earlier date, then you start to realize, well, this is indeed most likely the time of the Israelites in Egypt. So what relation could there be between the inscriptions and the Israelites in Egypt? And once you, you see a connection there, you, um, I think the door is open uh, to something quite extraordinary. Yes. So the two of you are working together on these uh, inscriptions. Uh, Maury McCall is doing a lot of the work, but you're supervising the scholarly work that he's doing because it, it takes it takes resources to do that. <laughs> you're not going to do one thing, you're going to be doing something else. So, Maury McKell, are you, are you uh, working towards publishing anything, a book, or, or where are you at with that? So, um, I'm tremendously gratified uh, by this uh, incredible relationship that I have with uh, Dr. Van Der Veen. And, um, you know, it's the synergy that we have between us is, uh, is fantastic. And um, what, you know, he, his challenges to me have just made this work so much better. And what really, you know, sold, you know, him on this was my uh, ability to demonstrate um, evolution of the script. We can actually date these inscriptions uh, to this particular time. What Dr. Van Der Veen aspired me to do and uh, uh, pushed me to do, and I love his criticisms and invite them very much, is to look at the work of my predecessors and other colleagues in the field. I've actually taken very important insights from my colleagues in the uh, in the field and my predecessors, and it's just making the case that much stronger. So as I'm now entering the third phase of this, what has been a five, six year project, which uh, we hope will uh, lead to um, a PhD. So we're in this third phase, um, now working on these inscriptions from, again, what we consider to be roughly the Joseph period. And that's just going to provide all of the context for the later inscriptions that I've been writing uh, proto papers on. And so we're bringing the project to a close and um, the final thesis should really be something uh, very powerful and exciting. If you know, people are interested in uh, my scholarly and non-scholarly academic work, my broader work is found at bigpicturetorah.com. For me, that is really what it is all about. It's about the big picture of, uh, you know, when we take the wisdom of, of secular research and Torah, uh, Bible research, and see a greater whole. That is www.bigpicturetorah.com. Let's talk about what you found where these inscriptions are, because there's a location called Sirbet al Qadim, and this has caused both of you to believe Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula near these inscriptions, right? Let's talk about uh, Jebel Sania and Jebel Horaba. Uh, I believe that's the correct way to pronounce it, mm -hmm. uh, pronounce them. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Peter, um, I know that there's been thinking that the, that this area was the location where the Israelites came. What are your thoughts about that because of these inscriptions being there as well? Quite honestly, um, I discovered that we do have actually predecessors from the 1920s, um, 1930s, who already suggested exactly these identifications of the Twin Mountains, actually locating the site of Mount Horeb near Sirbet al Khadim exactly for the same reasons, because they see Hebrew writing here. These scholars, um, like Hubert Grimmer, about 100 years ago, uh, suggested that um, this is a very powerful argument against liberal scholarship, dating the Pentateuch very late. Actually, already Hubert Grimmer um, was so convinced that what we are having here is, is evidence of the Israelites at the mountain, so that he was actually suggesting precisely that that the Israelites had been there, and so or or. 
our, our suggestion does not stand in isolation. It, it definitely has several forerunners who have actually come to the same conclusion. And, and there was a woman who also uh, wrote about this. What was her name again? Dr. Lisa Eckenstein. So uh, essentially, um, you know, I have a very uh, strange uh, and uh, habit, and that is that I always like to attack, uh, you know, try to attack my own um, understandings. I always try to be my own worst critic. And um, you can see in my earlier proto papers and that I have been following the line and I very much respect the position of David Roll of a Mount Sinai at, at, of a Jebel, a Musa Jebel Safsafa. That is a position that has tremendous support to it as well. But I happen to have, uh, came, to have come across a um, particular paper suggesting Jebel Samia and Jebel Ghuriba. And it just struck me, uh, two things. Number one, the names. Jebel Sania and Jebel Ghuriba, and that's the, essentially the way you would pronounce them. Etymologically, meaning considering how languages shift over time, those are plainly the equivalents of Sinai and Horeb. So those are two bounds that are somebody's in history, Sinai and Horeb. But unlike Jebel Musa and Jebel Safsafa down in the south, what is fascinating is that there is no known cult or religion that has ever owned these. They do not represent any early Christian group, any early Jewish group, any, any known Muslim group for sure. They just stand there with those names until this day. And one of the rules in geography is that rivers and mountains you know, it doesn't matter who the conquerors are over time, they generally maintain the same names. And Bedouins are very conservative and very loyal generally about preserving these names. So what are these mounts? They happen to be very, uh, very low, and that fits an important ancient Jewish tradition that Mount Sinai was the lowest of mountains. Um, they fit something that is taught by the Ibn Ezra, one of the greatest uh, um, Sephardic rational rabbis of the medieval period, and traditions of the Samaritans um, in terms of their uh, formation as, you know, two mounts. Uh, and if just the location is incredible. Although, you know, there are counterpoints, of course. So David Rule, for example, said, where's the water? That is an area that is very dry. So one of the things that really, that you know, of course, Dr. Vanderveen just took this idea and took it to a whole other level with, you know, the materials that are available to him and tied it into this wet phase. And this is so exciting because at the time of the Exodus, that area would have been very well watered. He made other connections, for example, um, of where Refidim, which was the encampment right before Sinai, would have been. And just little by little, this whole picture started coming together. And the reason why that is um, so extraordinarily significant is because one of the things that are missing from any of these other uh, candidates for Mount Sinai is where is the writing? illiterate people that we can actually demonstrate even from ancient Egypt from a days in the slavery of the sojourn we were illiterate people the Hebrews how could they not have left something um, suggesting any of the events of the Bible extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and this has always been a weak point for faith so if it, it just happens to be that these inscriptions that for so many other reasons seem to suggest the context of the Exodus, they, they just happen to be in the backyard of what is seeming to be uh, the strongest candidate for Sinai and Horeb, names that literally have been preserved to this day. And again, don't happen to serve a, you know, a particular polemical position. So, for example, in the Southern Sinai, you happen to have a the Catholic Church, you know, who had a bastion there for many, many, many centuries. And from the perspective of monks who are just living there from generation to generation, they're going to know their environs and they're going to, 
you know, look back into the terrain. And it, in other words, it, that could explain this pattern, you know, of these encampments that have been preserved by the Bedouins that David Roll and I have been, you know, promoting all of these years. What you were suggesting is that there were explanations as to how some topographical names were were placed there, possibly because it, they were they were filled in over the years. And we're going to actually talk a little bit about that in the movie coming up. And so for those of you uh, who are uh, interested in this movie, I mean, it's hard to, to imagine all the years of work that have gone into making this next film. And I don't think there's really been a film that has looked at uh, what we're going to be doing, six different mountains. Uh, we've got actually two films. The first one coming out in October 17th and 18th. It's going to be in 750 theaters. And you can go to PatternsOfEvidence.com to look for that, where to buy tickets, and invite your family and friends. And we're excited, you know, to introduce Dr. Vanderveen and, and Maury McKell to the world and let them see what they've been doing, what they've been working on. I just wanted to also say, Peter, you have an event also coming up, correct? Yeah, that's true. On October 7 through 9, we have a annual conference of biblical archaeology in Germany, which is a hybrid conference, but people from across the world can participate through Zoom. They should contact me and they can connect. And the, the main topic will be on inscriptions from biblical times, but a big part of it is also dealing with the, the, the Pentateuch and with the remains of Egyptian language within the Pentateuch pointing to a very early origin of the biblical scriptures. I'll be fascinating. I also understand too that you have a, a new book that's been published on chronology. Yes, it's actually more related even to the content of the film because it's related to the time of the patriarchs and the Israelites in Egypt. We have a book that came out only weeks ago, and it's called In Search of the Biblical Patriarchs, a historical and archaeological quest, which came out through Masthof Press in Pennsylvania. And it's, um, it's taking the reader on a journey, looking at the archaeological evidence from the most modern evidence uh, that we are having and looking at this and, and asking the question, when did the biblical patriarchs live? If they lived, when did they live? And we actually came to an astounding conclusion that based on the most modern information, um, the, the description, the circumstances in the Bible about the patriarchal era just make perfect sense to actually show that this, this is something that, that really happened. Mm -hmm. And what you've seen too is that it happens earlier than what, let's say, more liberal scholars would have said, correct? That's correct, yes. We indeed do have the uh, the biblical patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob between 2000 and 1800 BC. Uh, that's where the Bible basically has the biblical patriarchs and the Israelite surgeon in Egypt following on that. It's basically a period uh, known as Middle Bronze 1 through 2, where we actually find the evidence one would be looking for if the biblical story is true. Why should people care that the Exodus journey to Mount Sinai and that the events at Mount Sinai are, are, are important today? I mean, this happened a long time ago. Why should we care? Is there a broad way to, to explain why this is important uh, and why it might be important to actually see this film and to, to maybe start to understand, are these events really historically true? Did God really come to a mountain and, and meet people? <laughs> Yes, well, I think uh, the whole story of the Exodus, um, as well as of the patriarchs, plays such a central role even within the New Testament scriptures. Actually, it is the beginning of the Israelite nation, and it is the very beginning of God's uh, story of salvation that's starting there. If this is not true, if it didn't happen, why should I trust the rest of scriptures? Because this is where it's starting, and this is where God is making the promises that will eventually lead to the birth and the resurrection uh, and death and resurrection of Christ. If this is not true, why should I believe the rest? Mm -hmm. And Maury McCall, coming from a Judaism position, why is this important to you and to the rest of the world? Well, that is literally, according to our tradition, when we became a nation. In fact, we see that the, the, the laws that the, in the time of the patriarchs were something different in Genesis. And it's really only when we become 
um, we stand at Mount Sinai, that we become a nation. That is our very foundation. Even from a secular perspective, the Bible itself is such an important uh, historical witness to the times that it narrates. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the Historical Faith Society. We're going to be seeing you in the movie. So there's a lot more to this that, that that's why if, if you want to follow uh, Maury McCall and Dr. Vanderveen, we'll find ways for you to follow their work. Peter, we're going to put up the information. How would people contact you? They can write an email to me. My email address will be online and they can write to me and we will send them the link and the details when they can participate. Will it be in English? There are several lectures in English. There are some in German, so you know, you do not have to actually watch uh, everything, but you can actually pick and choose. Also, some of the German lectures have English translation on the PowerPoint slides. All right, well, thanks again. We appreciate all that you're doing. It's just great to have these kinds of friendships, and we will be talking with you in the near future.